OTAN, Outreach and Technical Assistance Network. I want to welcome you to TDLS and especially welcome to success. And you've noticed it was after COVID. We're going to say through COVID, but it seems like we're getting near the end. So we kind of went back and forth as to what to, to say. Um, my name is Susan Coulter, and I'm one of OTAN's uh, DLAC coaches. And I want to introduce our panelists from Garden Grove Adult Education. Uh, we have Director Melissa Patterson. Wait, Melissa. There we go. <laughs> And uh, teacher, Alisa Takeuchi, there we go. And from Tested Adult School, we have coordinator Will Netterson. Hello, everyone. And teacher Virginia Burroughs. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Melissa to tell you a little about Garden Grove. All right, thank you, Susan. And um, thank you to all of you who've chosen to attend our um, session today. I want to start off by saying I'm just so grateful to DLAC and the partnership, uh, the professional friendship and partnership that um, we've been able to develop with Tustin Adult School. So I appreciate that and also the Susan's coaching. As Garden Grove, as the director of Garden Grove Adult Education, very excited to celebrate 50 years of serving the adults in our community. And we currently offer courses on two campuses, but most of our classes are offered at Lincoln Education Center. In the next slide, you will see uh, a breakdown of uh, who we're serving. So right now we have students on our campus between 18 and 80. And I'm happy to say that when we added this number to this slide, it was uh, 1,057 active students. And uh, currently we are up uh, over 100 active students. Uh, so our ESL program, of course, is our largest program, as you can see. We offer ABE, GED, citizenship, pronunciation. Really proud of our high school diploma program that's grown to over 100. And then we also offer our concurrent high school credit recovery. We have an adults with disability and very proud that we actually serve uh, individuals from 24 cities in our community. All right, so as you can see on our slide, um, we have 29 part-time teachers um, in many different departments uh, with ESL, ABE, HSE, VESSEL, which we don't really call VESSEL anymore, it's our CTE, uh, English support classes, adults with disabilities, and CTE. We offer classes in the morning, in the afternoon and the evening, Monday through Thursdays, and then we also offer uh, a couple of classes on Fridays. So okay. here you can see, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was gonna say th thank you from Garden Grove. I believe we are passing it over. No, not yet, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's oh, okay. continue. <laughs> Almost, so as you can see, we um, at Garden Grove are um, in, in doing the high flex model of instruction, simultaneous instruction, where we have students in the classroom and online at the same time. Uh, the photo on the right, you'll see students in the classroom using Chromebooks, as well as on the big projector, you see the Zoom students who are also learning at the same time. There we go. Now for testing. <laughs> so hello, everyone. I think it's, it's pretty awesome. I need to echo what M Melissa said. It's been great to be able to join DLAC, but with that, really form this bond with Garden Grove Adult School. It's it's pretty neat. We at Tustin Adult School are based in um, in South Orange County, but we're another important point in South Orange County. So we service two different areas of the Orange County components, uh, Garden Grove more northern, us more southern. And uh, if you don't mind moving to the next site, we're based off of one site, but it's weird because we share a couple different locations. Our program is much smaller than you'll see our, our, our colleagues here in, in Garden Grove Adult School, but I think that's trying to help give the perspective of two agencies and what we're doing. Um, we're pretty excited to say that we have a total active students of 593. Uh, that is uh, growth or returning back to adult ed. We, we saw a significant drop last year. We've almost doubled in size uh, from last year, not in the heyday of 2018-19 uh, where we're almost 1,200 students. 
So we're still seeing that our ESL population is growing back uh, right now at 415. Last year, we were about 200. So it's really great to see that population coming back and starting to see some of that lower ESL population return, which is pretty neat for us. And then our citizenship, which we only serviced about 25 students last year, has already increased back to 62 this year. And then AB was another area for us that was quite small, almost doubling in size. So we're pretty proud of that. We did see growth last year that continues this year in our adult diploma and equivalency prep. And then our age range, it's pretty cool that we have individuals from the age of 18 up to 82, and they are determined that, that the couple of 80, we have a two 82 year olds that are here and committed to learning English, which is pretty cool. And we have 12 various languages um, that are spoken at our school um, besides just English itself. And just really proud of this. Like, I, I'm going to go to the image of our graduate right there in that um, far left corner. That was from our call, fall graduation. We've already had a total of 17 individuals who've graduated or completed their equivalency and looking to grow that as well. But we were able to celebrate that group in fall. So just great things that are happening. And then you see that top, top left-hand corner, I mean, right-hand corner, um, our uh, citizens celebrating citizenship as well. All right. And Elisa, there it is. Um, Tustin Adult School has 28 part-time teachers. Some of our teachers literally only teach one day a week. Um, so there's kind of a niche for everyone. We have one part-time counselor. Our program areas include ESL, ABE, um, diploma, equivalency. Um, we still call it VESEL, even though that's an older term for it. Um, we don't have a very, it really is more like VESEL than CTE for us. And then um, we have a citizenship program. Um, we don't have any afternoons, so our programs are primarily offered mornings, nine to noon, or evenings, six to nine, um, Monday through Friday through the mornings, and um, Monday through Thursday for the evenings. We do have a Saturday program, and um, our classes are offered both in person and online. Both Garden Grove and Tustin are part of OTAN's Digital Leadership Academy, more affectionately known as DLAC. Um, the goal of DLAC is to help agencies meet their technology integration, distance learning, or blended teaching goals. Um, it is a two-year program, and this co cohort will be completing in May with their final reports. Um, DLAC is open to all California WIOA funded schools and applications. Um, I heard in the keynote that they were opening in April. So be sure to check OTAN's website for DLAC under the trainings tab at the top of the page to learn more. And they have been a wonderful uh, group to be working with. Question one, what prompted you to apply for DLAC? So um, this is interesting. I think coming from a smaller agency and my background itself, before hitting uh, the adult ed world, uh, this is my fourth year in adult ed, I was an elementary school principal in our district, a teacher in our district and those components. And moving into test and adult school, um, Digital tools was not a big thing for us. We were very paper heavy, loved our paper, loved those components. Uh, the, the tech that we had was really being able to use a document camera to, to uh, replace that pro uh, overhead projector, if you think about it that way, um, some basic elements that were there. So it really looking for Tustin, it was how do we start integrating technology to make it um, a great tool for our teachers, as well as a, a skill to invest for our students to look towards the future, whether it was workplace, job place, or just supporting home as well. So that was Tustin stance of what we originally went in with was the idea of how to get that integration into our instruction using digital tools. Melissa, how about for you guys in Garden Grove? Well, I think um, pretty much uh, the same. Well, it was for me as a brand new director uh, stepping in uh, and being offered this opportunity to be a part of DLAC, really, I, I learned how important it was to survive through this COVID that we needed to um, increase our use of technology, empower our teachers to make their way through this. And I was fortunate to have Elisa invite me. Uh, she's kind of an OTAN star, as many of you know. And so I knew that uh, this would probably be a great uh, progress. 
I think we have a couple slides. Well, uh, Susan, if you want to go forward with the first one, well, there's some things I think on the um, the next slide, right? Oh, okay. okay. So sorry. Uh, the work for year one of DLAC had agencies create goals. What goals did your agency create, and how do they continue to support your agencies during COVID? So I, I think I get to talk first for Tustin. So Melissa brought up some things that's interesting. So you heard me share Tustin's original reason for applying really was about a digital integration just into our instruction and trying to build or base um, the, the need for those components to come and be, affect our students as well. I think COVID came as we were applied and sort of shifted everything that was the plan and really set new goals for us or opened our eyes to what some of our goals should be. So for us, it started looking about how do we onboard students to get them digitally prepared. Um, as you heard from me and Tustin, we lost almost 65% of our students with COVID. Part of it was because they were uh, students were nervous about technology, didn't have access to technology. So really learned that our students needed to understand what it was. Like a, I would say a majority of our students that remained with us either had previous technology skills or uh, somebody su to support it. So we really wanted to look at that goal of how do we build that in, in um, supporting our students. I'm gonna be honest with this, it's also supporting our teachers in learning the technology too. I think that's a part of what that goal means for us again. Understanding how to build a marketing presence uh, it used to be word of mouth. And uh, when we didn't see each other through COVID, how do we get that element out there? What is it that we do? Uh, you'll hear more. Uh, we've learned something from Garden Grove in that that we did as well as a couple other things. And then for us, you, you heard Tustin, we love paper. Paper was a really good friend of ours. So CASAS uh, testing up until this year was uh, only paper pencil testing. Uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to, through our, our district's approval process, bring students in to come paper pencil test. So you can see that that um, allowed us to at least get the assessment components going, but really wanted to move forward with e-testing. And then distance learning, I will be very honest with you, prior to COVID, prior to DLAC, uh, what we would call distance learning is when I uh, sent home a DVD player and a packet with putting English to work DVDs that students would watch. And then we would do a check in here and out, but really weren't looking at a distance program. So that was a big goal for us. Like, what's that clear expectation? What's that learning going to be like? And then uh, I'm going to go back to teachers. And I, it, sh uh, it changed for the second year, but first year was really about teacher professional development. And so that way they felt comfortable with the tools and could integrate those with, with our students as well. And so for us at Garden Grove, um, it was twofold. Like Will said, uh, we, we applied for DLAC. It was right at the, you know, the forefront of COVID. And so we were trying to decide how we were going to move forward in our next school year, you know, how that was going to look. And because Melissa was new also, um, we wanted to make sure that we created goals that would help with the whole, our whole program. And so we had decided to develop a Google Classroom for all of our teachers, no matter what department they were in. And so then teachers went through extensive PD on how to create a Google Classroom for their class and then how to get the resources and share the resources with their students. Our other big, big component was to register students all online. Um, prior to COVID, you know, it was the traditional triplicate where the students would come into our office and then they would fill out their information, um, including the WEO information. And it was on, a, on, a, on paper. And so we, um, our front office clerk, he um, developed a whole Google form with the exact same information. And then now students were referred to our uh, website and then they could register for any classes that they would wanted to take on that Google form. And then on top of that, since now we were doing everything online, we had to create an orientation. We had to create something that the students could um, use to help them be successful in our program. So we created uh, both an online orientation and an in-person uh, orientation. Uh, at the time, we were only using the online registration because we only had remote classes. Once we were able to open up our school again, then we would um, use the in-class uh, uh, orientation to help students navigate our program. <laughs> and um, so that they could be successful and, and navigate through our, sy our system. And am I one more? No, 
Uh, Melissa, I think this is you. Oh, okay. All right. So, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> Um, so yes, the, the other part of it is increasing our marketing and social media presence. Uh, we, uh, were able to, uh, create job boards and really, uh, market our programs. And then the high flex model of instruction using the owl camera has really been a huge change uh, for our students. It makes the learning environment, uh, a little bit richer for those who choose that distance learning. It's also uh, shown great growth with our, with our staff being able to go from sort of basic use of Zooming to a really complex model of screens and, and uh, instruction, live instruction. And then another goal that we set through DLAC was helping our students uh, use their school email accounts. How do you feel about the DLAC program? What's been beneficial? So I think I get to start with that one. And uh, Will and I are going to bounce this one in Virginia, too, I think, uh, back and forth. But I think the, the first thing that I can say about uh, what I appreciated were those top two bullets really coming together. Um, Dr. Porter uh, led us through strength-based leadership. And as a brand new director on campus, being able to uh, really look at my staff and to be really strategic about identifying strengths and um, bringing them on board and using those strengths to then have the courage to be risk takers. And we know that that's really what we need to do if you're gonna try to grow your program or recover your program as we did through those campus closures. And so I just really appreciated uh, the sessions we had with that, the collaboration that we had with Tustin, who was very similar in, um, in our, you know, our demographics. We're both in Southern California. And so uh, that, that DLAC, DLAC opened that door and provided those opportunities for us. So, and I, I think something to make mention, the past two slides we were talking about what our programs were doing, that was all based off the first year of setting our goals and moving those, that work forward for us. I, I think that came with, if you look at that third point there, it's the ideal 101 and 102 courses. Uh, DLAC brought in some coursework with that. The 101 was focused on foundations of distance, edu distance education and blended learning. Uh, for an agency that we hadn't approached that, it was a great process. It, it chapter by chapter broke down areas that maybe we didn't think about and really gave us resources and questions to really think through. Virginia, uh, I'm fortunate enough to have her as a teammate. Uh, I had an original teammate in year one that again, uh, found a full-time job somewhere else, but Virginia was able to be a part of the reflection with that as part of our team. And then moving in now, going through the 102 course, which we'll get a little bit more into, but it's really about um, resource evaluation that we get into. It's just been great reference material to give us um, really ways to think about what our next steps are. Uh, again, blended learning, uh, distance learning, um, uh, partnerships with Garden Grove or other partnerships as well, and, and hearing everybody's responses to the questions from the courses. Right. Um, honestly, um, I think COVID had the potential of being very isolating for most agencies, but I think DLAC really brought us into a spirit of collaboration you're in a statewide project where you get to meet with people from other agencies, top to bottom, every area of, of California experiencing similar and yet different things. So um, obviously you have the support and collaboration with OTAN, including our wonderful coach, Susan. Um, we get to work with other agencies. Some are very different. Some are very much like ourselves. Um, there's a regional partnership, which is, again, we uh, also appreciate our partnership so well with Garden Grove Adult School, uh, just a very similar um, location and, and in some ways, a similar population to serve. Um, it also fostered collaboration amongst our own faculty. The things that we brought home from DLAC um, really came into our staff meetings and professional development and really fostered that whole idea that you can lead, this is a leadership academy, but you can lead from any position. 
Very empowering. I agree with you on that, Virginia. I love how you you say bring it home, you know, really taking what we learn from th these support from Destiny led the Ideal 101 and 102 courses. Dr. Porter brought up that risk taking, uh, leadership based, engaging in difficult conversations, all those components. Then we had Susan, you, if you were there at our um, welcome and keynote, Penny and Netta mm -hmm. are always there, Marjorie, like everybody, it's a resource and, and support that you really bring through. So I, I feel like I've been able to network, even though COVID might have separated us, I think there's a stronger network. I, I know that I can send an email out, I can make that connection or bring it up in a meeting. Uh, and I feel empowered. I, I know it's a bummer to think that we're closing out year two in one sense of this component. But I, I know that I have resources and it's been great to know it's up and down the state of California too. Can you describe the progress that has been made in meeting your goals? And I think I'm going to uh, start that one off. And I think uh, the first uh, something that we learned early on was about marketing our programs. And given the changes that were going on, we definitely had to look at how are we going to do that? How are we going to be able to um, bring back our, our students who did not return and then also increase that? And one of the first things that we looked at here at Garden Grove was how we had been um, sending out over the years an expensive multi-page mailer. It was absolutely beautiful, but I wasn't really um, sure of the impact on it. And so I uh, met with my leadership team. We talked this through. We looked at other that things that come in uh, mailers in our own homes. And then we talked about this in DLAC. And so I went to the printer that um, had been supporting us with that brochure. And I wanted to still um, support local business and the printer helped design that top right postcard that you see up there. So we were able to still give a visual what was going on on our campus, uh, but in multiple languages, share with them that we now had online registration. And uh, we chose to go back and we mailed those out to every student who had been on our campus in the previous three years. And we feel that we had a pretty good uh, response to that. We also, because our campus was closed, right? We were limited the number of people on campus. We made the smaller signs that you see on the top left and that gave outside instructions. And we put some of these postcards outside so that people could walk up to our doors and our campus. We wouldn't have to have that uh, as many physical contact, but they could still get a clear instruction and uh, now on how to register online and see our course catalog online. I, I think something I'm going to add to that, um, the, this partnership, again, uh, I, I sound like the kumbaya moment of, you know, just really appreciating Garden Grove, but hearing it in the postcards, and we had a brochure that we were trying to produce, knowing it wasn't making it out to anyone. Uh, Garden Grove inspired us this past year to try and do that postcard as well, but I didn't have a printer, maybe not the great skills, so I, I, I used canva.com, and that <laughs> lower one that is in the blue and the whites, um, was able to put our images into a preset form formatted component of a postcard really truly was postcard size uh, and to build a postcard out that we then um, printed through Canva uh, printing classes were uh, decent we again I'm, I'm a smaller school so we send out about 1500 going back to that past three years of enrollment like was recommended uh, from Garden Grove and um, we spent honestly I think the printing of those postcards small five five by seven postcards was about three hundred dollars for the fifteen hundred it was there edited all those components through Canva so when I just put that plug out there if you're not using Canva that's a great resource to make your postcards or flyers if you want something looking a little different and professional maybe you don't have that artistic <laughs> mind but we we re-secured our, our process of distributing flyers through our schools as well, trying to get those out, knowing that schools were sending information out. And then that social media component, really trying to communicate. I know Garden Grove, you guys use that social media to um, really just say what's going on at our school and letting them know that we're open. I think that's, that's a huge piece. And then we've seen uh, supporting us word of mouth now that some students are returning and back in person, that word of mouth is helping us. But again, Low staffing. I don't know if anybody else is affected by it, but just trying to get staffing members. You know, I could open up more classes currently because I have wait lists, but it's it's now trying to get the word out of staffing. Hey, we'd like to hire you or competing with those full-time jobs too. So that's that recruitment side and marketing side that would go on. And I know if we move on, I think we'll get to registration if I'm not mistaken here. Um, 
I, I, Melissa, if you're okay with me, I'm going to start this one off and maybe you can sure. add to it. Um, really, registration had to be shifted. You know, I, I you heard me talk about Tustin Love paper. We didn't have the certificate form like our, our partners in Garden Grove, but it was paper. You had to fill out uh, a, a piece of paper for us to really say we're going to register and being shut down and we couldn't let people in to come fill out forms or wanted less touch points. It really was about getting registration online. So we're using Google Forms. Uh, I, I believe Garden Grove, you're also using Google Forms as that initial registration form where we're collecting information. Again, we do have to think of the balance of security. So I, I know for Tustin, we're not collecting social security number and thing, things like that, but it's been pretty amazing to have that registration process go through there. Um, my office staff can now see how many people are registered. It's a common practice for them to go in and see. I think what's great for me in, in year three and now year four, we've been able to see, oh, we've had so many people who've registered showing that they're interested in getting that comparison to those that are actually coming in to either assess with us um, or enrolling in classes and being able to do follow-up phone calls from it a little bit easier because we've got that list and that component. So that online, reg online registration form has really been pretty powerful for us. Melissa, do you want to add anything to that or? No, I would agree with you. And, and I think a surprise um, bonus that came from moving to the online registration form is our registrar now has a more accurate account at all times about who really is active in the system and, and moving students out when they're not returning. And so it's eliminated a wait list for us. Obviously, we're down in our numbers, but I, I know in the past we did not have that accuracy. So that was a nice surprise that came with that online registration. And then the other thing I would put there that we learned from our partners in Garden Grove, and I know, Lisa, you were part of the team that was leading that um, orientation program that was going on for Garden Grove is just requiring that you come in and, and do that. So we and Tustin call it orientation and assessment, and we schedule it. We use, uh, again, trying to use another tool. It has ads to it, but we use signup.com where we, we tell people after they've registered, we send an email out that they click on that link and can choose the day that they want to come in, that they're not having to call the office. Uh, if they call the office, we help them as well. But it, it's just that tool to say you get to choose. And the empowerment uh, signup.com sends reminders for me. I'm not having to send that out or work with my office staff as well, but really having individuals come in to do that assessment and orientation with us. Yes, and, and Garden Grove, yes, I'm going to turn that over. Lisa's going to talk about uh, the assessment. Right. Yeah. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Virginia. Well, I, well, my, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so at Garden Grove, um, we had really redeveloped our assessment um, because, you know, like Tustin, we had been kind of uh, procrastinating on the whole e-testing um, situation. But right before we closed down for pandemic, we had just started using e-testing. And so that was very fortunate for us because it really allowed us as an agency and then some of our students to understand how to get the testing done. Now, during the pandemic, that first year, it was very difficult for, do, for doing post-testing, uh, pre-test and post-testing. Um, trying to do it remotely, as well as you know, so many other agencies. Um, once we did, we're, we were able to come back and we started year one DLAC, then we actually were able to go back and think about the process and how do we you know, fix the situation that we were in. And we went back and we, we trained office staff to become proctors, which really uh, alleviated a lot of stress for, uh, for everybody because we had only one or two at the time. And now we have a full staff that can uh, proctor e-tests. Um, our other thing that we did that was very beneficial for us was that we were very intentional now on when we were gonna schedule our post-tests. Um, because that whole COVID year, we were just scrambling and doing the survival tactics of trying to test anybody <laughs> that we could. But then once we came back, we were very like saying, let's do the post-testing this time, this time, and this time. And we really stuck with that. And that helped a lot. As Will was saying about um, uh, orientation and assessment, we now also do that so that as soon as students come in, they get the orientation, they get that pre-test done. So that is off the table. There's no question now that all students come in with a pre-test. Um, and then as far as just for our agency, we use ventures. And so uh, students are tested on the unit after we have completed the unit. And so we have developed either um, testing so that online students could take it or also the in-class students now that we had been open and now that we had opened up our school and Virginia is going to go ahead and talk about testing agency yeah I'm um, very similar we except we <clears throat> pardon me we didn't pull the trigger on 
um, e-testing until this year. So, yeah. um, and actually, I mean, it does require a lot of training in our office staff. And I have to say, I take my hat off to our office staff. They've really rolled with it and it, it works. But I really sometimes think our faculty really doesn't understand how many eyes are on that to make a student show up in a class. It's quite a system, but um, the e-testing is working really well. And as the bullet point says, um, it actually makes the listening testing easier to do. Um, we do have the need for that. And sometimes logistically, that was just difficult and it's less difficult now. So um, that's one bonus for um, that assessment piece. Um, we don't use ventures, we use side by side, but it's the similar thing where we have um, unit tests. Um, we are also a um, you know, federally funded agency. So we do co-op assessments. Um, and then um, I'm sure very similar to Garden Grove in terms of how assessments are run through our high school diploma and through our um, equivalency preparation students. Mm -hmm. And I think I struck this one up. Um, for instructional practices, um, for core curriculum, what one thing that um, we did in test and we added Burlington English kind of in the middle of our pandemic experience. Um, we had some access through our core textbook, but um, we realized we really need something with a, a very rich um, online courseware. So um, that had really helped put curriculum into the hands of students. Um, that was a very big deal for us. And it really gave us a way to give students to do more work at home um, and in a very engaging way. Plus they were using all these new tools. So uh, Burlington English, plus just making better use of some of our, our paper and pencil curriculum that had online components. We're doing, we're doing better work with that as well. Um, do you want to jump in now, Lisa, or do you want me to do the end first? Go ahead and do the end. Okay, so we're gonna to drop to that, that fourth bullet where it says students reception of new skills or supports being used. Um, we're using primarily iPads in classrooms and a lot of our students were not familiar with iPads. And so we are seeing, because we're taking them into classes with help from support staff and from um, faculty, other faculty members that our students are just loving it. Um, having it in class made it feel safer rather than trying to do it separately. Um, they're enjoying it. They're willing to take more risks. Um, it definitely has boosted confidence. And I've been that person going into a beginning lit low class. And I, and I hear the students say, we love the iPads. When are we going to use the iPads again? And I, I don't think we would have heard that necessarily two years ago. We had the iPads, but we weren't using them as well. So I think that has, it's actually boosted our instructional practices. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, especially with the, you know, your, assessment about how technology was welcomed into the classrooms pre-pandemic, um, you know, then all of a sudden surviving during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, as far as team meetings um, for Garden Grove, we've been very, very fortunate in that our directors have been very supportive with us and that we actually incorporate um, professional development and um, team meetings level, you know, by levels of ESL or departments and weekly. And so we are able to collaborate with our uh, co-workers on best practices or challenges and things. And so we have a very real grasp of what's happening within our levels and how we can support each other. And then we can also meet with um, the levels either above us or below us or both into you know, suggestions of transitions. And so that's been very, very helpful for us. Um, we also do the, um, we also have been very fortunate in that um, uh, our, one of our consortium, uh, one of our consortia has um, sponsored us getting Burlington English uh, licenses. And yeah. so again, that was a, a very, um, at first it was a very small portion of licenses that we were able to, so we kind of incorporated it somewhat slowly. And then now as the push began, we got more and more and more. And so many of our classes now um, have access to Burlington English, which has been a really big boost for us. Mm -hmm. And so that has really helped with our, um, bringing back the 21st, you know, bringing the 21st century skills into our classrooms and getting our students um, really, um, one of our student learning outcomes is digital navigators. And that's what really one of the driving forces for us. 
And then, um, Lisa, I, before yeah. you click off on this, may sure. I add one more comment to that? Sure. Talking about that collaboration. Again, we're in Tustin, we don't meet weekly like you guys are fortunate, but through COVID and everything else, we learned how to meet as teams online. And it's been mm -hmm. interesting because coming back when we could come all in person, <laughs> uh, January came right after winter recess. I'm not sure how everybody else's districts were thinking or evaluating with Omicron, COVID variant and all of that. We were able to look at our, our, our ESL team and say, you know what, we're still going to have a collaboration, but we're going to take it online and go through Zoom. And it still was a rich, powerful collaboration because we've learned breakout rooms and things like that. So it, I think that's the other piece of surviving through COVID and after we give ourselves to those options. I know my uh, high school and equivalency and ABE teams will meet online for half of their team meetings. The other half will be in person as well. So we're seeing that, that it can be worked both ways as well. So that instructional practice is really uh, reflecting back into our teachers as well. So thanks for letting me add that quick bit there. Of course. Um, moving on to her. professional development with Virginia. Yeah. Um, the Will, my boss, Will, has an expression he likes to use about drinking from the fire hose. And I think at the beginning of the pandemic, we all felt like we were drinking from the fire hose. It was, it happened so fast. I actually got to the point where I'm like, please don't try to teach me anything else. I'm done learning for a while. And I'm sure our students <laughs> felt the same way because it was just a lot. Um, so the teacher PD that went on at that time, and as I'm sure as many of the agencies of those of you with us today, it was, it was a lot and it was a crash course. Um, the second bullet um, was something that we've kind of learned from this is that um, now we have the luxury of maybe providing a nugget rather than drinking from the fire hose, rather than that overload, uh, that, overload um, that really kind of went al along with the territory of COVID hitting us two years ago this month. So um, RPD now is, um, it often, I, I would say it always includes something um, technological so that people can use it in a classroom and for our online teachers so that it's something that is happening um, just, you know, no matter how you're teaching your class. So um, those skills are there, even if we got the crash course at the beginning, we're reminded of them, we're learning new ones, but in like smaller SIPs. Yeah. That's such an important component to things because, you know, when the pandemic first started, the teachers were drowning. Uh, we were, we had also become students because we were trying to learn so many things at once at the same time, trying to teach our students. And so, yeah, it was very difficult. And so it was trying to just survive and get all these resources in. Um, again, just piggybacking what we talked about before about our weekly PDs, um, in bullet three, just being able to revisit some of the tools that, that we were trying to learn very quickly and, and really turn around the next week and say what worked, what didn't work really was helpful because most likely sometimes agencies have a, a staff meeting maybe once a month, if that. And so you learn some tech, you know, some tech skills, but then you don't see anybody for a long periods of time and either they just drop off or people get frustrated or they have questions and then there's nobody to turn to. So we were really able to come back in our weekly meetings and talk and share with others what worked and what didn't work. Um, our TOSAs, um, they did a really, really good job of really incorporating within our weeks, um, bringing in some other, some other TOSAs, our district TOSAs, tech TOSAs in to share with us some skills and um, develop our professional um, resources to help our students the best way they can. And again, it was just being able to learn it and then use it. And then a lot of times we, we would do it within our PD itself. We were not just listening to uh, a directive, but we we're actually doing it at the same time. And that did, that was with CASAS or that was with data. It was with so many other um, elements that we needed to learn and it was hands-on. That was what I think our teachers really appreciated. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that something came out that we've been reflective in, in talking as agencies is the, the support staff professional development that really came out from that. It really was not only teachers understanding how mm -hmm. to use the tools and even thinking of G Suite, you know, how do we use it for our instructional purposes, but then bringing it back, you, you heard us talk about for our recruitment or registration, we went to Google Forms. So there, there really was a training for staff on what that is, what's our process for enrolling now, is that changed from that paper base and, and pulling that information out. So it really was 
I, I, I know for us in Tustin, sitting down with the teams, this is how we see a Google form, this is how we're going to get our students to understand it, or just going through the registration process where it's not a, oh, come in, you know, we're going to lead you to our website, click on that, <laughs> that, that image there, you know, for at least us in Tustin, the link is right under this large picture. So we always say, go to our web page under the large picture, click on that link, you know, and, and understanding that and then understanding how to communicate with our students that orientation and assessment for us using signup.com. Um, we have a process that we, even on the Google form, my office staff through training process knows that they put their initials. So we know who sent that email. That way we can do that follow up when somebody says, oh, I didn't see it. We clearly see that that's been identified. We have a staff member that does it, our color coding and highlighting components that go into it. So really that training of the processes is something that's been important. And then we in Tustin have this digital skills survey that's been part of our orientation that we have students fill out to really see if they understand how to send an email, how to search on the web uh, on a website, those components. So it's just making that a process that we've had to train through and, and meet with our teams. And Melissa, I'll, I'll let you keep going. I feel like I can keep talking them forever. Sorry for that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it is exciting to see that through DLAC and our collaboration um, with other agencies, especially Tustin, hearing their practices. And so this was something that was exciting here is to really empower our office staff with additional jobs. Uh, I think traditionally people kind of stayed in their lane and this was this task and her task and his task. And so we learned through strength leadership to really find those strengths. And I saw this office of uh, my clerical staff just kind of come to life. Could you, would you try this? Can you come to this training? My toses were fabulous in putting in those supports and those strategies. And um, I think it's just really changed the whole dynamics in our office. And one fun thing that I learned early on in DLAC was just the importance about routinely checking in. And so when it was just my clerical staff on campus and my teachers were still um, off in the distance, um, I started a stand-up meeting every Friday so we could um, meet at 8.15 every morning. Uh, because it was COVID, we wanted to make sure we were stay, you know, spread out and masked. And uh, But it just it has become a really fun thing on Friday mornings, just 8.15. Uh, you see everybody heading up for, uh, and it's all of them. My, my custodian makes his way up and the staff members come around and we're sharing now. And people are sharing about what projects they're on and it's um, and and then the toses are there and they know, OK, this week we're going to work with so and so and this and that. And so it's just really been exciting to see that move into uh, the support staff as well. How has your team grown and benefited from the 102 course? But let me say this first. These are some of the um, modules from the 102 course, which is um, on resource evaluation. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about the 101 course. And that was more getting the site plan together. But these are some of the things that uh, they uh, were studying, different modules within their course that they wanted to uh, talk about. So my question is, how has your team grown and benefited? So I, I think for us in Tustin, the conversation has been, it's more that opening, you know, of understanding how are we really wanting to look at resource tools, not just say, oh, here's a new resource. Oh, here's another resource. You know, I go back into, and Virginia quoted me on it, that fire hydrant here, I can spray a lot of things at you or keep <laughs> piling on and on and on. <laughs> But really understanding is what we're trying to talk about or discuss or reflect on really beneficial. And I think that that's this ideal 102 really got us to that point of, you know, how are you going to evaluate that? How are you going to make sure that this is a, a tool that is going to benefit, whether it's the teacher and the student, is it truly the student? So it's breaking out these components. And uh, we were fortunate to be introduced to different rubrics to then create our own rubric. So you're gonna see for Tustin, that green in the columns is our rubric we took and broke it around. We have this overall effectiveness that we go back to that's the top of ours as we go into these different categories about accessibility, uh, user usability uh, for the teacher, for the student, uh, looking at financial impact, you know, what's the cost, is the, how, how is it being maintained in those pieces. And we went through and we evaluated and we were encouraged uh, by DLAC to really go into a new tool and um, 
something that you might want to use. And for us, Virginia and I reflectively, uh, our ESL teacher uh, is a little bit, I don't want to use the term jealous, but wants a tool that can be used both <laughs> in class and online that mm -hmm. students have resources to for citizenship. And so we've been talking about it and USA Learns and their citizenship models was something that we went through and evaluated to see what's there. And again, there's been positives as we went in and explored. And so Virginia and I each completed the rubric and came back together and evaluated, trying to look for a program. So we think we're going to go pilot now that we've evaluated uh, with that teacher and, and students. So that way they have those resources, but that's the design, design structure that is there uh, to really say, you know what, are we going to benefit and not just waste everybody's time component? So mm -hmm. that's where we are, and that's the tool we're using. I think we know that we want to tweak it, especially as you hear what our, our partners at Garden Grove are going to share, and then uh, what we learned from other DLACs that shared, because we all got to hear each other's rubrics. Uh, we know we want to go back and, and tweak the tool, but at least it was our starting point to really get deeper into, uh, is this a valuable component or resource or app that we want to be able to use? Thank you, Will, and definitely the benefit of um, DLAC and, and 102 is really um, looking at your needs and then the idea of this rubric, and they shared in-depth rubrics with us, and then we were challenged to create our own, and as Will stated, the task, the original task was to evaluate something before you purchase, but um, here in Garden Grove, we had uh, jumped in and we had bought the OWL360 cameras, but there were still additional pieces that needed to come along with that. So we used the rubric for an existing product that we had, and we wanted to really understand, is it being effective? And then we decided to go one further step. And what we did is we created a rubric for the teachers to respond to. And then we also created a rubric for our students. And so Elisa and I created a Google form that followed the same questions as the rubric. And we put it out to all of the teachers who were using the OWL camera. And here you can see one of the responses. So we aligned our student questions to be very much in line with the teachers as well. So we would have data that we could compare and look at. One exciting thing uh, in response to all of this was we did find that our teachers really found that the OWL camera, uh, the red signifies their strength, right? And in most of our uh, the responses, we discovered that the OWL camera really was a benefit for the teachers. And we learned that our distance learners really appreciated it as well. So um, the DLAC really taught us this evaluation and how to look at this and gather data. And now we'll be able to use our rubrics for purchases that we plan to make in the future as well. I, I just, I'm going to add that it's a nugget I think we want to steal in Tustin is the wisdom of putting the rubric into a Google form so that way you could survey that way and pull that data rather quickly, I, I think is a great tool to think about and, and uh, use. So uh, again, a compliment to you guys in the Garden Grove team. Thank you. What are your agency's next steps to meeting your goals? All right, so for Garden Grow for our year two, um, because now we're, we're kind of like taking a deep breath, that first, the year one was really just go, 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 because we really had some long-term goals, but many of them were short-term. We were just trying to check off the list. And so now that we were able to kind of sit back and relax, uh, um, we can actually set some goals that we can make long-term. And so for one of them is we really want to strengthen our PD um, for new technology. So kind of taking what Will, what Tustin did and utilizing the rubrics for some new technology that we are thinking about using. And so we will develop a rubric for that. In addition, though, we would also like to continue to use rubrics as surveys um, for equipment or technologies that we're using currently, and especially again with the teachers and with the students. So we'll go through maybe through our um, our uh, Burlington English, and then also with our ventures, and really, you know, getting a feel for how is it that the students feel about the the resources that we are providing for them for their instruction. And then um, the last one is that we really still want to um, develop our orientation because it's an ever flowing thing because we've been so up and down with um, 
how the school has been structured as far as in class or online, um, the high flex masks, no masks, things like that, that, you know, we're, it's going to be a continual flow of uh, the development of the orientation and to further, you can see our student learning outcomes. We, we just went through WASC accreditation, which we got our six years. So that's super, super exciting for us. But one of the biggest proponents was that we had to redeveloped our, our student learning outcomes. And we were super proud of them because we had the whole school working on it together. And so um, it's a buy-in. We, we're all bought into this. And so now we are really ready to share them with our students from the get-go, from when they start orientation. They are still, they are now being introduced into our student learning outcomes and they are being sucked into this um, as well as this is what we want for you and we want you to succeed. So those are really exciting for us. Um, Will, do you want to do this one or shall I? I, I? I would be glad to, or would you prefer Virginia? I'll do the first one. How about that? Go for it. Um, we'll we'll if, share. Yeah. For our top three goals, um, we have identified exploring other ways to support student digital literacy through classes. And I, when we kind of started out, we thought, oh, we'll, we'll get to students before a class. We'll try to front load that. I think we're finding great success, especially with our lower level learners. Um, that they're what we need to get them comfortable in a class and then get the devices in a class um, in terms of getting technology into their hands. Um, I think that's been to us obvious that they're more comfortable doing it in a safe and supportive environment. Um, and it's fun. I think they enjoy the fun nature of it. So um, we, we just need to continue exploring other ways to support that literacy and comfort. So well, and I, I think then going back to like uh, shared from our Garden Grove colleagues, this need to really evaluate um, the the tools we're using, the apps we're using in our curriculum as well, uh, getting that feedback. I, I know we talked about the differences. We were asked one way and Garden Grove approached another, but even that reflective on the tools that we're using currently in what we think digitally, this is the use of an iPad or do you need access to a laptop? Those kind of components mm -hmm. and evaluating that. So we would like to develop those rubrics and I'm gonna be honest, Garden Grove, we're gonna steal, put onto a Google form so that way we can <laughs> get that data and, and condense it down, but really trying to get that student voice. You know, I think that's the piece is sometimes we get so focused on the educator and the office staff, but it's the students we're servicing. So wanting to make sure that evaluation of those resources uh, and digital skills are, are really meeting students needs and hearing from them as well. And then uh, we've always called it the teacher toolbox. How do we keep developing professionally that teacher toolbox with the, the, the technology that we have, the new apps, the new strategies that are being used and really pushing uh, our student success. I think whether we do it through co-ops or just our basic instruction, uh, Burlington English has made us have to touch uh, a digital tool more. Is our teacher's balance between the two? So just trying to push that forward as well. So that's what year two is about for us as we're trying to move forward. Um, I'm sorry. Susan, we're not going to yeah. Yeah. No, uh, we're running out of time. <laughs> it's, it's been pretty amazing. They've, they have a lot to share. Um, and we want to thank our panelists. Um, if you have questions, um, these are the contacts um, for Garden Grove and for Tustin. So we want to thank you.